Everyone, shalom. Uh, welcome to today's program uh, of the Ghetto Fighters House International online series, Talking Memory. My name is Medin Shahar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and educator. I want to welcome our global audience from all over the world, including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums and institutions, academics and students from universities, historians, and our many friends who attend our Talking Memory series. A special welcome always to the survivors and their families that are with us today. We want to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. Today's program is in partnership with the USC Shoah Foundation and the Rabin Sher Forum at George Washington University. And before introducing our speakers, I would like to invite Amy Carnes from the USC Shoah Foundation to say a few words. This is our second Talking Memory project with the USC See Shoah Foundation with Amy. Among her many roles, Amy supports development projects to sustain the Institute's global programming. And we are so grateful for her involvement in the project we will be discussing today. So Amy. Thank you, Maydeen. Um, and hello, everyone. I was gonna say good morning, but for most of you, it's probably not morning anymore. <laughs> um, so as many of you know, uh, USC Shoah Foundation was founded in 1994 by Steven Spielberg after filming Schindler's List. Um, and we're delighted to be here today uh, to, you know, participate in the conversation. Um, our visual history archive started off as a collection of, you know, collecting Holocaust survivor um, stories before it was too late. It now holds 55,000 testimonies from witnesses to a number of genocides, including Rwanda, Cambodia, um, Armenia, and more recent violence like South Sudan and uh, the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, and through partnerships like, like this one and others around the world, we, you know, our main kind of focus is using testimony to support educators, researchers, but community members as well. Um, and all of this, you know, allows people to make connections through testimony in support of our mission to develop empathy, understanding, and respect. Um, and so through this mission, we have worked with Rachel for a couple of years. Uh, Rachel Cerati's commitment to storytelling is a kind of natural fit with our mission and with the kind of mountain of stories that we're sitting on. And so um, for Rachel's first podcast, which I'm sure you'll hear a lot about, We Share the Same Sky, which you might already be familiar with, um, we worked together and kind of really saw the value in having that kind of storytelling presence. And so she's now serving as our storyteller in residence and working on, and she's the co-host of a new podcast that we will launch next month called Memory Generation, which I'm sure she will tell you much more about. Um, but that podcast will allow us to tell some of these stories that we become aware of every day through people like many of you on the call who might write to us and say, hey, I, I found this, this Whole strain of my family I didn't know existed or I you know did a search on ancestry and found a cousin in Israel um, and so it's these kinds of connections that we uh, think are so important in carrying this history forward and we feel a unique responsibility to be the sort of caretakers of this history to make sure that it's there you know 500 years from now and preserving the archive but also in participating and initiating conversations like the one today um, and so we're really grateful for Ghetto Fighters House for including us in this conversation and look forward to, um, you know, future events like this and continuing to unearth some of these amazing stories of community connection that we have in the archive. Thank you so much, Amy. I am very grateful for our uh, connection and I hope we have future programs together as well. Uh, and now I would like to introduce our speakers, Rachel Serati and Itai Barr. Uh, Rachel is an award-winning photographer and writer and educator and audio producer. For over a decade, she has been retracing her grandmother's Holocaust survival story and documenting the echoes of World War II. In the fall of 2019, she released her critically acclaimed podcast that Amy mentioned, titled We Share the Same Sky, about this story. It was listed as one of the best podcasts of 2019 by Huffington Post as a Show We Love by Apple Podcasts and a Reader's Pick by Vulture Magazine. In addition, it received a literary award from the Missouri Review. The podcast is now being taught in classrooms worldwide, accompanied by educational resources 
developed by USC Shawa Foundation's Eyewitness and Echoes and Reflections. Rachel's memoir, also titled We Share the Same Sky, will be published this summer and is now available for pre-order. Rachel is currently the inaugural storyteller, as Amy mentioned, a uh, storyteller in residence for USC Shaw Foundation and is based in Portland, Maine. And that's where you're coming from today. Amy, you're in Maine? I am. I'm up in Maine. Rachel, <laughs> wonderful. Now, before I continue on to Itai, I just want to say that I will put um, a link to your uh, webpage and also to share the same sky for those who are interested and continue to uh, look at your work. And our second speaker today, our interviewer today is Itai uh, Bar, my colleague and friend. He is also an educator and guide at the Ghetto Fighters House. He guides youth groups to Poland and has an MA in Holocaust Studies from the University of Haifa. He himself is also a 3G or third generation descendant to Holocaust survivors. And uh, now I will hand over the program to Itai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, for the kind uh, uh, presentation. And um, and uh, we we have a we prepared a, a comfortable night for you uh, to rest assured behind the scenes and not to be uh, in front. And uh, hope you'll enjoy and and take part whenever you feel like like it's time. So hello, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and. Um, Wherever you are, I hope you are comfortable and, and you're ready for what we prepared for you for this evening. We actually are, uh, d during these past few months um, with the Talking Memory series, uh, we've looked into a lot of topics. Um, we've researched history together. We've uh, uplifted and unfolded a few uh, of, of the mysteries of, of World War II and the Holocaust. And today we're kind of not sidestepping, but, but looking into a, a different direction. Um, we will try to uh, kind of uh, uh, go along with, with Rachel's story and, and the way she chose to tell it. And we will bounce back and forth between the past, the present and the future. Um, this type of uh, theoretical time traveling um, will correspond with, with Rachel's uh, amazing project. I have no, no better word to, to describe it. The project is called We Share the Same Sky and, and we will mention it a, a few more times during this uh, talk so, um, so you'll memorize it by the end of it. Um, this is a, a, essentially a seven episode podcast about how one Holocaust survivor's story echoed throughout the following generations till it reached the point where well, uh, a podcast was produced uh, in order to tell that very story and how it flowed between time, space, and many people's lives. Um, so my, my first question to Rachel is, uh, do you agree with this description? Um, or how would you describe the essence of We Share the Same Sky? Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, first of all, before I even start, hi, everybody, and thank you so much mm -hmm. for having me. Um, it's really exciting to be with this international audience. Um, so I think one of the best things about having this podcast out into the world is hearing how other people take it in, because I started working on this project when I was like a very, um, confused college student, I guess you could say, I ended up at a university that wasn't right for me. And it was really diving into my grandmother's story that gave me some direction because I was very focused on wanting to be a photojournalist, which was actually corresponded with my time living in Israel when I started working um, in that profession. And over the years, the project, but more so my grandmother's story has meant many different things to me. And what's been really beautiful about having her story more formally out in the world in this type of platform is hearing how other people relate to it. I think one of the best or my, my favorite ways to describe it these days is really that it's an examination of how the retelling of family history becomes the history itself. And I think as I got to the end of producing this show, that was really what I, what I realized is what I was doing was, tra was trying to figure out how this had changed over the years for not only myself, but the other people involved in this story. Okay, thank you. Um, and before we, we move on and dive deeper, um, let's, let's uh, play a segment out of the first episode so we will all 
kind of get it, get into the atmosphere of the podcast. Um, so one second, I'll share my screen. I knew a version of her story as a kid. I knew she survived the Holocaust, that she was the only one in her family alive at the end of the war, that she escaped over and over again. I knew her home was covered in paintings and photographs of Prague, masks and paperweights and postcards from different places, pictures of family she lost and those who came after. Every piece of art in her house had a story. Sometimes we would break her stories. Sometimes at holiday meals, we knock over the precious stemware. The sharp edges of the thick red glass would cover the floor. The disposable pieces of her childhood memories laid out in front of her descendants. I took her stories for granted at the time, but that's the role of the grandchild, to accept what came before as normal. My grandmother was stateless for 17 years, and the last time she saw her family was when she was 14. I was 21 when she died, but in a way, I've spent more time with her after her death than I did when she was alive. Her history has become a delicate spider web woven together by the thin threads of family stories passed from one generation to the next. In these stories, time isn't chronological. The retelling of family memories has become the history itself. And I want to invite you to come with me into the homes of strangers, to the places where people saved her life, where a story of war is experienced by the next generation. But first, I want to introduce you to my grandmother, Hannah Dubova. Dubova means oak tree in Czech. My grandmother was strong like an oak tree. She knew that too. I am extremely independent. I uh, make my own decisions. I take my own consequences. When my grandchildren says, you know, this isn't fair, life isn't fair, I says, nobody told you life is fair. Life is not fair, but you have to deal with it. I mean, just this segment is, uh, if we unpack it, we can, we can spend the whole night just, just, you know, talking about these, these couple of minutes, but, but earlier today, uh, we, we chatted and, and you mentioned that, um, and I'm surprising you now with this question. I hope, I hope it's okay. You said that not not many people chose that that segment um, in in previous uh, talks that you gave about the podcast. So I'm curious about wh why did you like? Uh, I I'll take credit for it. Uh, why did you like my choice uh, of of this uh, uh, piece? Yeah. Um, so I, I have two answers to that question. Um, first, uh, first is the description of you know when I talk about how sometimes we would break her memories. Um, and there, there's a line there and it's in my head, I don't, I don't say this in my head, it's referring to these like Czech glasses, these wine glasses that she had that I just have very distinct memories as a child during Passover seders, um, us grandchildren breaking them and not realizing the severity of it. But I was speaking to a group of eighth graders earlier this week and one of the eighth graders brought out that line and nobody had brought it out before and it's one of my favorite ones. So then you, so like twice in one week, people brought me like attention to this part of the podcast and it just, I don't know, it, it's a, it's a very positive memory for me of just like good family times, even though I feel bad that we broke her stuff. Um, but then the idea, one of the things I love about that clip is what my grandmother is saying because she was fiercely independent. That's how I knew her as a granddaughter. She had a, like, she just was driven to do what she believed in. Sometimes that was incredibly embarrassing as a grandchild. Um, but this idea that life isn't fair um, and you have to deal with it has certainly been something that I have leaned on as a piece of wisdom over and over again from the very small things to the very larger tragic things in my life. And I, I think it's one of the most raw, honest things that someone from an older generation can say to you. I, I can't surprise you with, with, with questions, I see. Um, <laughs> Go on, keep trying. And really yeah. <laughs> but, but before we, before we dive deep and, and get to know Hannah and, and her story and how you blend into it, um, a podcast about 
the Holocaust? I mean, how, how did you come up with it? How, how did it uh, turn into your, your life project, basically, so far? So far. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's definitely been a life project. I started this, as I mentioned earlier, I started this when I was in college. I was 20 years old. Um, and my grandmother's story has really been the backbone of my adult life in, in more ways than one. Uh, it's not just professionally, but very much personally as well. And, you know, if anybody had told me when I started digging into her story that it was going to be, I think, going on 12 years now, I, there's just no way I would have signed up for that. Like, that is a huge amount of work. But with every new thing I learned, with every new person I met, with every piece of history that surprised me or challenged me, it made me want to read another book. It made me want to dig into another story. Um, so fast forward a bit. I'm about to give a lot of love to show a foundation here. <laughs> fast forward a bit to like, I don't know, sometime around the end of 2017, early 2018, Stephen Smith and I, Stephen Smith runs Show Foundation. He's the executive director there. Uh, we actually connected on Instagram of all places. He somehow found my work, which- How fitting. <laughs> yeah, well, it's remarkable because it's not like I have the largest Instagram following and I didn't then, um, certainly. But we connected he said to me, he was like, hey, you know, is your grandmother in the Visual History Archive? And I was like, you know, that's a great question because probably because she recorded in a lot of places um, and maybe call me a bad journalist, but I hadn't thought about Show a Foundation. You know, I think that in my head, it was still like Steven Spielberg's project. Um, and then a few hours later, Steven sent me a four and a half hour long testimony uh, of my grandmother, which was my missing piece because this whole project started with me sitting down with my grandmother and asking to write down her story. And we had these one-on-one -on -one storytelling sessions during the last year of her life. And um, I, only, I only wrote it. I didn't record her audio. And I asked myself whether or not that was good or bad at the time, because part of me wishes I had that conversation on tape. But being that what I'm really interested in is memory as a topic, um, it's interesting to think about how that memory of that conversation has changed. So, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but once I received that testimony, the world of audio opened up to me. It corresponded with the time that audio storytelling first came into my life through a, a program I was working on with Boston's NPR station where they had been doing a little mini series about my story. Um, and so it was just kind of all the ideas got firing and then lots of credit to Shoah Foundation that they helped find me the support to do it and um, and gave me the support to do it. And then <laughs> a year after uh, the social isolation of a, making a podcast, which is different than the social isolation of a pandemic, um, this came out into the world. And, you know, I also have a book coming out and a lot of the podcast was, you know, I started writing it by taking pieces from my memoir, which was already very much well written. Um, and then trying to learn how to adapt it for radio, which is a very different style of writing. And what I found by getting to the end of it was just how perfect the story was for radio and, and for audio, because the voices allow you, as you mentioned in the beginning, to go between past and present in a very different way than I was able to with visual storytelling or with the written word. And so it's just been a lot of fun. It's been a really good exploration to figure out, like, how do you blend these testimonies that were recorded, you know, over 20 years ago now with the voices of today? Yeah, and, and it's and it blends so well. I mean, I mean, as an as an audio production, it really brings to life in, in ways that honestly, I, I, I'm a very, uh, uh, I would say, an addict to podcasts. I, I, I listen to podcasts almost every night. Um, uh, since since I don't know a few years ago, where, where, where I discovered that this is the this is the new thing. This is this is what we like. Uh, you can choose what to hear. You can choose when to to listen to it. Um, but this this was completely different. I mean, it, it really grabbed me as as a as a professional in my field in, in Holocaust education. Um, in a point where I said, well, I, I mean, it really speaks to the generation, and I'm and I'm wondering to my generation and i'm wondering if, if you were aiming it to uh to to speak to that generation of of uh, uh of people who remember young people who remember the holocaust but not really you know they don't really know how to uh, uh approach it in 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 many ways 
Um, well, so when we created the podcast, um, we I worked with Shoah Foundation's educational team um, with Eyewitness and with Echoes and Reflections. And that was because we were able to create it knowing that it was going to go into classrooms. So it's seven episodes. Every episode has a lesson plan that goes along with it that's free and available online for any teacher to use. And so I had mentioned um, that I had been open up to the world of audio storytelling from this program that I did with WBUR, which is one of Boston's NPR stations. And they did this thing called, it's, it's Beyond Sides of History, and it actually won a bunch of awards, and you can just Google it and find it. Um, and that that mini series dug into my story and a friend and collaborator of mine, Julie Lindahl, who's the granddaughter of an SS officer. And she and I found each other through, well, <laughs> if you find that story online, you'll find out how we met each other. And that's a story in itself. Um, so the woman, Erica Lance, the radio producer who made that show, she had gone freelance when I got the funding to create. We share the same sky. So I called her up and asked her if she would work on this show with me. So the two of us took this on as like a two-person production team. And we had very clear goals at the beginning, which was that I was going to think about how this would work for educators. And she would think about how this was going to work for the general podcasting community, because podcasting was a very new um, avenue for me for storytelling. And so I really credit Erica for teaching me how to how to make a podcast. Um, and she so, really we have, yeah. yeah, she did really good work. And I mean, when we look at what it took to write episode one versus episode seven, she was a very good teacher along the way as well, because I didn't need as much help by the end. Um, but, you know, so we really had this twofold audience. We had, how is this going to work in the classroom? And how is this going to embrace um, contemporary technology. And as you said, podcasts are really this incredible thing now. Like they're absolutely my favorite way to take in stories as well. And how do we reach students through a media that they're already naturally using? But then also how do we make the story engaging for general population as well? And I'll also say that one thing that's been very important for me, and this applies to the podcast, it also applies to the forthcoming book, as well as when I speak with audiences, is that I want this to be approachable and interesting and relevant for a granddaughter and a grandmother. And I think that there's a huge value that we have from talking about history in an intergenerational perspective. I have gained so much insight to my own identity and my own relationship to this history by having conversations with my mother, because we we take this on very differently. We feel we have very different feelings about it um, in a very natural way, and you know, in a positive way, I would say. Um, and I'm hoping that this story can help start dialogue within families, not only who are related to the Holocaust, but you know, other other periods of history as well, other experiences as well, and be able to start a conversation about what does it mean to inherit. A story. Yeah. Again, that saying for itself is, is worth uh, an hour of our time, um, but I'll try to stick to the script. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, Hannah, about your grandmother, um, who she was uh, from your point of view as her grandchild. Sure. And then I, I'm going to ask you to tell me a little bit about your grandparents as yeah. well. So I'm going to turn the table on you <laughs> after. I'll so um, my grandmother Hannah was um, wild and embarrassing and outrageous and funny as hell like she was just such a character I say this in the very top of the podcast which is that like when I was younger she would like let us as grandkids like make her these disgusting concoctions like after the Passover Seder or whatever dinner all the grandkids would run into the kitchen and like literally just combine everything that was edible into like one glass and she would chug it. And she would just like do anything to make us laugh. For my bat mitzvah, she dyed my hair green because she called me and asked me what color I wanted her hair to be. And I said green, and so she did it. Um, she just had this like, she was vivacious. Like she had this love for life. She loved to travel. And as you heard in that clip, she was independent. So she would, even as an older woman, she would go on all these like tr travels and group trips alone. Like she, she, she was happy to be alone. She writes in her diaries that, she would go on these hiking trips and she was always the only one to get in the water. Um, and she, she was really proud of that. And so she had this zest for life. And I think that's one of the things that has been remarkable when I go backwards, because that's really what I had to do to get 
back to World War II was to, you know, kind of reverse time a bit and think like, okay, well, I grew up with this woman who was, you know, just had wanderlust in many ways and such this appreciation for life. And she called it a gift. You know, how does someone with such a tragic history and such a sad, lonely experience that lasted decades, how does, how does that person become this, this person who seems so happy to be alive and so happy with what she has? And I think that that's, that's where a big thread of it came for me, where it was almost this, you know, these things that don't seemingly make sense fit so much for her. And I really wanted to, to explore that. All right. So now I'm turning it on you, Itai. Tell me, tell me about your, you also have grandparents who survived the war. Yeah. And, and it's two very different stories, but somehow in our, in our talks that we had throughout this year, and this is, this is something that maybe uh, one of the greatest things that, that COVID created, it's, it's the time to have, meaningful talks online and and with people that you you would never meet um unless unless this would have happened um so so my grandmother she's um she's she was uh, she's still alive but she she's not doing most of the things that i'm gonna i'm going to uh, uh attribute to her um she was the, the one of the greatest cooks i've ever met um, um she prepared wonderful food for me and my uh and, and my brother and my cousins every day we used to go straight from school uh straight to her place um and then and then there was like this this um almost military-like order for how things are, are going to happen the first thing is to drink fresh squeezed orange juice um if, if you would not do that um you would not be able to be uh, uh to sit down at the table and and eat lunch and then uh you had to eat your soup and if you were not done with the soup, you would not get the main course and et cetera, et cetera. You know where this is going. So, so all these food issues were, were always there. Um, but she was this very, I mean, super sweet, super kind, um, super devoted to, to take care of us, the grandchildren. Um, she, had, she has only two daughters um, and, and four grandchildren and now already four great grandchildren. Um, one of them, I admit, is is my uh, my doing, um, and and, um, and and she was this this magnificent person for me, so powerful. And when I found about her story, when I learned about her story, um, I think I rediscovered her. And that was only when I was twelve or thirteen years old that I learned about her Holocaust story. Um, I was one of the first. I think one of the first listeners to the to the real horrors of her story and it was a, at a very young age and I think it's part of what well it, it's part of what brought me to this point to to uh, 20 yeah 20 years later and I'm all in I'm all into this uh, topic um, I'm studying it educating uh, through it and and well but hopefully educating to prevent anything similar to happen. So, so she's, yeah, she was that person um, uh, and also the inspiration for the rest of my life. Amazing. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's also an emotional uh, uh, evening for, for the two of us, I guess, because uh, uh, my grandma, she's still alive. She's, she's 93 years old, but, but yeah, it's, uh, she's not the same anymore. Um, after your grandmother passed away, um, what happened that made you uh, take on this huge project? I mean, you, you decided to go on this journey of a lifetime. Um, and I'm what, I wonder on your motivation. What, what was it? What was the, the trigger? Yeah, well, I, I think there were a lot of, a lot of steps um, to get to, to where I'm at now. Um, first and foremost, so, you know, after she passed away, I discovered this incredible archive of her life. And I, I this, the first episode of the podcast talks about this. Um, and it was just this treasure trove. It wasn't, it wasn't a secret archive. Like my family's story is not one of secrets, which a lot of, a lot of stories of World War II are. Um, but she had just beautifully curated her life. And I always say that had my grandmother grown up in a different generation, she absolutely would have had the profession I have now, I think. I, 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 I really believe that she just would have been incredible as, a, as, um, 
as, as a storyteller, um, but she just didn't really have that option. And so I, I took this on, I went to school in Philly. I, that's where um, she lived right outside of Philly. And I moved back to Boston after college, which is where I'm from originally. And I, I, I sort of just like, was like, I'll be an official family <laughs> historian and nobody pushed back on me. And I went into this like rabbit hole where I just digitized everything. And it went through, it went through phrases. So at first I was just gonna make a book that was about our family history. And, you know, keep in mind, I have this like, you know, this uh, very um, uh, <laughs> intense goal of being a photojournalist during this point. And when you're a young, storyteller when you're a young photographer um one of the the pieces of advice i would always hear was like you know pick a story and start a blog um and so i was like all right so i started a blog and i picked a story and i figured well no one else can tell my grandmother's story like the way i could like that's a unique perspective and so admittedly that's that's what brought me into it um and then over time, you know, <laughs> as a writer, I probably could have written about my grandmother's story without ever leaving my bedroom. Um, but as a photographer, you really have to go out and be places. So I started conceptualizing this really large uh, project that probably made no sense to anybody at the time, but um, really big, you know, gratitude to my community because I did this crowdfunding campaign to raise a bit of money and essentially went on the road for a year and subletted my apartment and kind of had this big, you know, mid-20s goal of, of traveling and, and that's what I did. Um, so, which is incredible because it, <laughs> I, I it really, it would not have worked because my, let me take a step back actually. My goal was to go and retrace her, her path of displacement. And, and so I was really interested, I think at that time, the language I was using was like to document the languages, lives and landscapes um, that she experienced. Full acknowledgement. I was not a refugee. I had a credit card in my pocket. All of those things, of course. Citizenship. <laughs> Citizenship. Yes, everything. You know, lots of privilege. Um, and so, but I was really curious of the cultural aspect of it because something that was incredible about my grandmother was that she knew how to tell a story depending on who the audience was. It's why she spoke a lot in schools. It's why she spoke to, you know, she would change her story if she was speaking to people of her generation versus if she was speaking to a class of eighth graders or ninth graders. And so when she told me her story, I was a 20 year old, uh, 21, 20 year old, I was 20s. Um, and she told it to me like it was a story of adventure. And since my grandmother loved to travel, she really leaned into sharing all of the experiences of having to adapt in language about the food. And so that was sort of the story I was walking in with was, you know, um, a little bit glossy eyed to the whole thing. Like there was, there was this sense of adventure. It wasn't until later in my 20s that kind of the the intensity and the heaviness of the Holocaust started to come in. Like, I feel as though I really had to mature into the story, um, partly because I started with what my grandmother had given me, which was this kind of sense of adventure and curiosity, because what she was telling me was her story of displacement, but also the, her story of adapting to new places and what it meant to survive and what it meant to have that independent streak. Um, and so anyways, I got a little bit off track from your question, but it's taken all these different, the, these different shapes. And so I can't say I like knew I was going out for as large of a project as what it's turned into, but I certainly knew I was going out for something and had to figure out what it was. Um, and I'm glad I didn't know what it was going to be because I think it really allowed me to embrace whatever was coming at me from an experience. And that definitely changed the way I've told the story. I hope that answers some of that. I'm, as you can tell, like this is how I felt in my 20s. And people were yeah. like, what are you doing? I was like, well, let's find out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And, and I'll find out. That's, that's the genius element in, in this project because, because you really, you, you went with the flow. I mean, you went with the adventure. And, and this is how the podcast, the podcast came out. It came out like an adventure. And if, if, you, if you're a listener, a good listener to it, you're experiencing the adventure along uh, along with you with the narrator and this is uh, again all all the compliments to the chef um so before before we listen to another segment um and 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 it speaks about this this very specific um uh point taken out of the uh, out of episode three um 
but there, there's a special place for you and and for for or within your grandmother's story to Denmark to to the state the great state of of, of Denmark um, and and I wonder if you can just you know try to put us places in in, in context uh, in order for us to be able to listen to that strange request that you uh, 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 requested from from people you you encountered in that yeah. wonderful country yes so actually just this morning my my family we were on zoom with our chosen family as we call them over in Denmark who are actually some of the people that you're gonna you're gonna hear from in a moment um, so just to to give kind of the the um, cliff notes of my grandmother's life um, my grandmother was born in a small town in Kolin, uh, at that time Czechoslovakia, now Czech Republic, and she, her family moved to Prague when she was one, and she had a very happy childhood and until the Nazis came in. And when she was 14, my grandmother got what she called a lottery ticket. It wasn't actually a lottery ticket, but that's how she saw it at that time to get out. And she was able to leave Czechoslovakia on this rescue mission of sorts with other young members of the Zionist youth movement, so the Chalutzim, and they were taken to Denmark with the idea of being put on, well, they were put on foster farms with the idea of staying for six months and they would get room and board and they would learn how to pioneer and they would learn how to like learn agricultural skills with the goal of eventually going on to Palestine. And so that was, and she was like, very um, dedicated to this and to her friends. It was a huge part of her identity. Um, she left uh, Czechoslo she left Czechoslovakia with like the boy she had, you know, was like in love with and I just had her first kiss with. And so when I say that, you know, she took me on this story of adventure, these were a lot of the details that she lingered on was what, you know, she really told me the story as from her perspective as a 14 year old. And what I always say is that we tell a story so differently when we know what happens at the end of it. And my grandmother had this skill and this desire to tell me the story as she felt it back then. And I certainly try to infuse that into my storytelling as much as I can. Um, but so she, she gets to Denmark and you know, what happens is Denmark is not occupied when she gets there in October of 1939, but fast forward six months to April 1940, Denmark's now occupied. It was a bit of a lighter occupation. You hear that whole story in the podcast. Um, and uh, jumping ahead a bit, she does end up being a part of the rescue of the Danish Jews. But prior to that, she's going from foster farm to foster farm to foster farm every six months because as the war progresses, it's getting harder and harder to travel for all the obvious reasons. And so the clip you're about to hear um, is a request I made to someone who was part of her life at that time. Yeah, so let's listen to that. I wanted to come to Denmark and live on a farm like Hannah did. And I wondered if any of his relatives would host me. You know, finding a farm like beginning of the 40s it won't happen. But then I I think I talked to my eldest brother. His wife said, what about Sine? Um, my name is Sine and I live here in Denmark on a farm. And I'm, <laughs> I'm a granddaughter of Jensine. Sine is Knedarne's niece, one of Jensine's 14 grandchildren. And of course, I am named Sine after Jensine. My uncles, they called me and said, oh, Sina, we have this American uh, photographer and she want to she wanna see how life is when Hannah was in Denmark. So it's much better that she stay with you. And I just, okay, it's no problem. <laughs> Maybe I can get some help. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I told Sine I'd help with the animals and do whatever I could around the house, just like Hannah had done. And in exchange, I wanted to photograph my time with her family. It was the closest I'd be able to get to documenting my grandmother's life. So, in February of 2015, I moved in with Sine. I moved in with the granddaughter of my grandmother's foster mother from World War II. How many people can can say that you know that is uh, you moved in with the 
<laughs> granddaughter of, of the person who saved your grandmother in World War II. That's, tell, tell me about that a little bit, about that experience, you know, just. Yeah, so I'll say it was probably one of the most transforming relationships I've ever built in my life is with Sine and her family. And I, I reached out. I mean, it was incredible. They let me come. I mean, I think that's also the perk of having a farm is you have space for strangers to come <laughs> and hang out for a bit. Um, but uh, <clears throat> Yeah, they, they're, I over over the, the years after that first visit, I probably stayed on their farm cumulative more than anywhere else in the world because I am um, part of this project was being a nomadic journalist for many, many years. Um, and that, so meeting her was so monumental for me internally. Um, I mean, partly as like a journalist, I was like, wow, I'm doing such a great job. I found these people and I, you know, it was like really exciting. I was like, this is what I tried to do. This is what I want to do. Um, from a more reflective space though, what Sine's, what Sine, her uncle, Knidarne, who you heard there and the rest of their family, what they provided me with this was this really humbling feeling that my story is not my story, it's our story. And I had gone out with this very possessive attitude that I'm going to follow my grandmother's story and it's going to, you know, this was my history. Like everything was kind of in the I and the my, and there would have been no story there for me to document or for me to explore or for me to learn from if their family had not also cared about it, loved the story and passed it from generation to generation. And lay it at another point in the podcast, you hear Knud Arne, who is the, the son of Yensine, who took in my grandmother, you hear him say, you know, that this was a good story in his family because they saved someone. And that we give a lot of, you know, as we should, a lot of space to hearing the, the stories of survivors like my grandmother. But then there's these other individuals who hold this history so tight and they, they were not victims, but they helped people survive and it meant something to them and therefore it meant something to their next generation. And I think that those are really important stories to lift up. Um, and I'll say that that was a trend that I found in my grandmother's story. And perhaps because hers is one of light and dark, even though she was the only survivor in her family, is that I kept meeting these people that held so deeply onto this period of history because it was a point of pride that they did something right when seemingly the rest of the world was doing wrong. Um, and so that's, that's really what they offer me. I also, on a very personal note, after living on a farm, realized that I really like quiet spaces and that's kind of how I ended up in Maine. <laughs> so um, I really appreciate having the chance to live not in a city and being like, wow, this is really relaxing. Um, so they've, they've changed my life in more ways than one. Yeah, I, I don't live on a farm, but I, but I live in a, in a rather uh, countryside area uh, of Israel and, and, it's, uh, and, and, and I understand that. Um, yeah, it's nice. Really. <laughs> um, so, so a little bit more into that uh, into that uh, part of the story. Um, you literally walked in your grandmother's footsteps. I mean, it was it was important for you not just to uh, kind of go to the same places, but also to try and live sort of the same life. Um, how how do you explain that? I mean, what, what was what um, was going on in your mind when you? Yeah, I mean, it kind of like it sounds a little crazy. I don't know if crazy is the right word. It, it sounds a little peculiar. Um, I think that there was just, I didn't know how else to do it in a way that was going to engage me. Um, I don't think that just studying her story or learning the history from history books um, was going to give me what I wanted from this exploration. And I, I don't even think I could tell you what it was that I wanted. I just kind of knew that that wasn't going to satisfy whatever this like desire in me to figure out because I think along the way you know oftentimes people ask me like why did I do this project and um, probably to to you know my publisher's frustration I don't have a very good <laughs> answer for that but it's just been this constant like evolving question of like what does this mean to me what does it not just for my identity what does it mean for my place in the world today what is my responsibility to all of this um, and I think that by I'm somebody who learns from experience. Like I'm somebody who kind of has to like 
do something wrong to figure out how to do something right. And so I think by physically going to these places, like that was the way her words were going to make sense for me. So my grandmother was a very gifted writer and a beautiful writer. And later on in her life, she wrote, she took this class called uh, Memories and Memoirs or Memoir, something of that sort, where she wrote stories and, you know, a teacher would help her edit them and whatnot. So I had all these beautiful writings of her reflecting back on her childhood. And so she has this lovely piece called Stepping Stones in My Life that she writes about the train ride out of Prague through Germany and getting on a boat and eventually going to Denmark in 1939. And, you know, I could read it from home and pair it up with the history books and put it in context and understand what it meant. But until I was actually on that train, leaving from the platform in Prague, looking at the landscape, hearing the train move, um, realizing that nobody was asking me for my passport and understanding that her now stateless passport held all so much weight at that time, like a matter of life and death. Um, suddenly the words meant something differently and I, I feel as though I could relate to them in a different way or at least imagine them in a way that felt more real. And so, I mean, just as I'm talking now, we talked about like the back and forth between past and present. And that's really what it was, was like, how do I take her words with me and actually put them into present day so I can talk about them from the present day? Um, and I think that that was really what I was trying to do. It's easy to talk about now what I was trying to do, but at the time when people were asking me what I was trying to do, I don't think I had quite such a succinct response. Uh, I, can, I can relate because um, a lot of what I do today, um, is 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 part of that you know of that process of of absorbing the story uh while i was uh during my childhood and and i absorb the story so well that it's not that i i remember every detail i don't think my grandmother remembers every detail and even even in her memoir there are a lot of details that are that were left out i mean that are missing but but it's, it's somehow that, that I know some of the feelings that she had during those times because trying to, to uh, again, to, to get closer to that, to understand it better, not, not just for, uh, there's, a, there's a bit, we, we spoke about it, there's a bit of selfishness to it, right? There's a, Absolutely. We, we want to find why is that story so, uh, influential to us why is it so impactful and, and 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 on the way of understanding that we do all these uh crazy things uh not crazy peculiar that's that's a, a way better word um you took on that that amazing journey and 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 you know myself i i chose well i say that i chose this job and and chose to go back to to Poland and to educate uh, uh, teenagers about what, ha what happened there. But, but when they ask me, why did you choose to do that? I, I tell them, well, I, I didn't. It, in many ways, it chose me. It's, it's just, just the way things were, were created for me. And I'm not a big believer in, 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 in uh, uh, non-physical or human forces, but, but, but this is what it is. You know, it's, uh, I hear that from a lot of, um, I think, you know, descendants of, of survivors or, you know, people who are going back into their family history, whatever their history is, is that there's something that's almost just this like magnetic force of, I don't know, I just like couldn't not. Like there was just, I, I, I it was like an itch you couldn't scratch to put it really lightly. Um, and, and I think that if you had like the answer to why go back if I like had a really good concrete answer, I probably wouldn't feel like I had to do this work anymore. But, you know, something that I feel very lucky for where my grandmother's story has led me is that, you know, I've gotten to spend all this time getting to know her. And in so many ways, I feel closer to my grandmother now than I ever did when she was alive because I've just spent so much time with her story, with her words and talking to people about her um, and hearing how her story impacts students and, and other individuals. And that's that's helped me get closer to her as well but then but then it's like her story brought me to all these other stories you know so so earlier amy had mentioned that we're making a new podcast for a show a foundation called the memory generation which like takes the same kind of essence of this idea of like what do these stories mean for us today 
and exploring that and trying to understand that. What does it mean to inherit memory? And so because of my grandmother's story, I'm now being introduced to all these other people who have left behind testimonies um, for the next generation. And it's this crazy thing where like you can get so close to someone who isn't here anymore. And there's like, there's, it feels a little bit tragic and sad and I kind of have to like fight through some complicated emotions to say that out loud. However, there's also something really beautiful about that. Um, and I think family history is this like incredible, just like touchstone between past and present and between like, you know, who we are and who we could be. And the, just this, this space to explore oneself and to explore one's role in the world, but also to make connections. Like Itai, you and I have had a lot of opportunities to have conversations this year, even though we haven't met in person. Yeah. And I feel like we, we find this like really beautiful intersection um, in this space where we have this shared experience, not us individually have a shared experience, but we have a shared experience of having a grandparent who went through something like this. And so in all these ways, it can make these lovely connections. And I, I feel as those, those connections have also been fostered for me with um, grandchildren of Armenian survivors. Um, you know, I've gotten to do stories with, you know, children of Cambodian survivors. And there's, there's this space where we connect if we allow ourselves to connect through it. So, yeah. I'm wondering, did your did your grandparents leave behind testimony? Yeah. So, in 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 very uh, concise, uh, the very concise version is is that um, the, during during the 90s, she decided that she wants to. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my grandfather passed away when I was two years old. Um, they are, they are also, by the way, both of them are from former Czechoslovakia. So we even share that that bit that bit. Um, but she decided to tell the story. Um, it was it, she was already in her seventies, and and she decided to do it parallel to the decision to go back to Poland. She she she's an Auschwitz survivor, um, so so she met hell from from first hand, and. She decided to go back to Poland with students. Um, her first trip was with my mother, her her uh, younger daughter, and 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 alongside that, she decided to uh, write her memoir. and And I think that she waited too long. She waited too long to uh, process everything and to uh, write down uh, all of it because because the story, as I as I mentioned, lacks uh, a lot of details, but but still it delivers the the essence of what it means to be a teenager. She was she was 15 years old when she was deported in May 1944 from uh, from that temporary ghetto uh, next to uh, uh, what what today is the the Ukraine. Um, she was deported straight to Birkenau. I, I think she manages to transfer that that message that story, but. But you have so many questions after you read that, and and honestly, I've tried to uh, to look and to uh, uh, research all around that story. Some of those uh, questions are still open to me. Are, are still um, I'm still looking for the answers, and and maybe this is this is part of the drive. You know, part of what uh, um, keeps me committing to this uh, history and to my personal story every day because when I stand in front of uh, students then then I'm not I'm not there just as an educator just as someone who took upon himself the mission to to tell uh, to tell about history and to teach with with this uh, uh, complex history I'm there because because I'm, I'm trying to deliver my my grandmother's requests I'm trying to uh, kind of convey her messages as well and and this is it brings me to to the last question I will I will I will ask you uh, this evening and then we'll uh, turn to the questions from the audience. Um, one of the biggest challenges I experience as a, as an educator in in the various educational settings that I participated in is is creating that connection for those who don't have a personal connection to the Holocaust, those who are not descendants. And I'm wondering if you see or how you see uh, we share the same sky um, as an option for for those who don't have that personal connection do, do you see it as a maybe an incentive um, for those who uh, who are out there and, and are looking for that mm -hmm. special connection 
Yeah, no, I, that was one of my goals making this um, was that, you know, as a certain, this is of course a Holocaust story, it's a Jewish story, um, but I, it's not limited to that by any means. And I, I went out with this idea that it was, it, I mean, you could say very broadly, it's a human story. Um, but, you know, I'll start with an example, which is I have, I have many of my grandmother's diaries, which is quite incredible because I have her diaries from the time she was a 13 year old to through some of the years of the war to, yeah, it's, it's wild to like later on in life. Um, you know, it, it took some convincing between my, me and my mom for her to trust me to read the ones later on in life for all the obvious reasons. People don't write their diaries thinking that someone else will read them. And I really had to make a good case for me as a journalist that I had to read them. And I was like, I won't read it as a granddaughter, I'll read it as a journalist. Um, and I did that. But I would say, you know, I also got some very valuable um, insight as a granddaughter, as just a person, because yes, you have this overarching history of World War II as the backdrop to her story. However, so many of the emotions that she met as she went through it, they're such universal emotions. So in her diary as a 15-year-old girl when she's in Denmark and, you know, she's getting to meet with her friends in the Zionist youth movement, they, you know, they're all in separate homes, but every couple of weeks they get together in her diaries, you know, you see a little bit of longing for her parents. And, you know, I, the older I got, I would note that stuff more. I was able to see it a little bit more. As I said, I got, um, as the gravity of the Holocaust started to really um, sort of solidify in the way that I understood her story. But uh, within all of that, you have very teenage emotions. You have, why does this boy like me? Why doesn't he like me? I love him. No, I don't. This friend is stupid. No, she's not. She's my best friend. No, she's not my friend. You know, it's like such typical human emotions. Um, the way she writes about loneliness, the way she writes about vulnerability, the way that she um, contradicts herself constantly, like emotional contradictions, I feel like is like, I can't live without them at this point. And I feel as though her story has given me a lot of permission to lean into the idea that you can be sad and happy at the same time without them taking away from one another. So to say that my grandmother felt in some sense that when she left Czechoslovakia was an adventure because as a 14 year old girl, she had no idea what was coming next does not take away from the heaviness and you know the, the horrificness that of what came next. And so these themes, these um, spaces of identity and thinking and um, resilience, this is relatable to anybody. And so what I really wanted to do and what I what I try to do anytime I approach stories of history is like to pull out these things that somebody from anywhere in the world could relate to because ultimately, our history should help us make a better future. I mean, our grandparents went through something that is incomprehensible. I mean, I still can't wrap my head around it and I think about it every single day. And so how do we, how do we use those stories to make the world a better place, you know, in, in those very, you know, large idea. And I think part of it is to establish connection. And how do you make connection? You find places where you feel similar to somebody and that, and these human emotions, these like inside things, um, I think are our point of connection. So I really, I really try to do that with the podcast is I really try to um, let those emotions drive the history. What you said there, um, use those stories to make the world a better place. That That's really get a fighter's house. So, uh, so you're hired. Um, <laughs> Thank Whenever you, you, uh, you do that uh, huge transition and coming here, um, if you, if you do that, uh, no, no pressure. Right. Help, help me with my Hebrew and we'll... Yeah, yeah, yeah I promise. Um, so before we uh, move to questions from the audience, um, uh, just uh, a couple of uh, notes from you about your next projects that are coming up. Um, there's a book coming up and also the uh, podcast. Uh, anything yeah. you want to tell us about that? Sure, yeah. So um, I have a book coming out in August. It's by the same name. We share the same sky. Um, it's a little bit uh, crazy to me that it's coming out so soon. So I'm in that like very like excited anxiety stage. Um, so you can pre-order it. I think it's a little, I, I'm not sure if you're able to pre-order it from Israel and Europe yet. Um, but if Underway. you aren't and you want it, reach out to me um, and I will make sure that 
that it gets to you when you can. Um, in America, you can definitely pre-order it at this point. And then i um, very excited that there's a new podcast coming out um, for another podcast for a show, a foundation. And this time I'm teaming up with Stephen Smith, uh, executive director is the one who brought me my grandmother's testimony to begin with. And we are doing just this. We're diving into the archive, not just stories of Holocaust survivors, but other individuals who've given testimony for Visual History Archive. We're exploring those stories and we're finding um, their intersection of past and present. And so that will, our first episode will come out April 15th. Um, and I think Amy's putting information in the chat about that where you can find more information and it's on my website as well. So that's exciting. So very much in the weeds with getting that out and also very, there's a lot of like excited anxiety happening in my life right now. <laughs> so great, the creative process is in full swing. And so, but I, I'm, 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 I, I feel it to be an, an entire privilege and pleasure to get to know all of these other um, people who've witnessed, witnessed history and get to work to retell their stories. That, that they are our source of, uh, of inspiration, definitely. Um, yeah. And when the pandemic ends, hopefully another trip to Israel because it's been too long. So yes. I was supposed to be there last summer, but COVID. So I, I promise coming up soon. <laughs> take you to a good hummus place. Uh, this is how we host here. Um, so uh, oh, we'll, try and, <laughs> we'll try and take a couple of uh, uh, questions from from the audience uh, with the help mm -hmm. of of Medine. Yep. I saw that my good friend Alyssa should Hi. Be wrote us a good okay. question. So. Sure. First of all, thank you both for uh, mm -hmm. such an intimate uh, discussion. And I think that the audience that was with us really uh, had a privilege to, uh, to hear a story in a different way. I think uh, I think that, again, I want to thank, thank you to both of you because uh, my first podcast <laughs> is Rachel's podcast. And Itai would say, no, have you listened to it yet? And I'm like, not yet. Um, and why am I mentioning this? Because really one of the questions uh, someone is asking as a photojournalist, how did you make the transition from visual that's erased <laughs> into audio? And um, how did that affect your, uh, your photography? Mm -hmm. Okay, great question. So one of the first things my co-producer Erica Lance, the one who had to teach me how to make a podcast, one of the first things she said to me was, audio is the most visual media. And I was like, what? <laughs> I haven't, <laughs> do you see how much money I've spent on cameras throughout my life? Um, and uh, she was entirely correct because what audio producing gave to me as a complete gift was this ability to use my photographs in a way that felt much more visceral for me. Um, so a lot of my descriptions come from me looking at my pictures and like, I would say like my photography, what I've kind of reflected on over the years is that really it's like my most intimate way of interacting with an experience or with a world. Like I really love photography because it gives me an excuse to be anywhere. Um, when I was, um, you know, my, my first internship as a photojournalist was in Jerusalem and it was like, I had an excuse to be anywhere as a photographer. Um, and so when I needed to like bring back very visceral feelings, photography was the best way to do that. Um, a lot of the video I took um, also became some like the, the sounds that you hear in the show. Um, and so, yeah, so podcasting was really this like harmonious uh, um, coming together of my photos and the written word. So, and how has it made me a, a, a different photographer? Well, I haven't, it's interesting. I don't know. I haven't really thought about that, but um, I think that it, it, I've become a better listener with audio producing as well, because when you're, when you're collecting audio from somebody, if you interrupt them, that's in the tape. Like I can't really use that. So it forces you to sit and listen to what somebody's saying and being an engaging listener in a way that a right, being a writer or a photographer didn't force me to do, even though it would have it's good practice, of course, to be a good listener. Um, but with a photograph, you don't know what I'm saying in the background. So it doesn't really matter if you're, you know, where, where your engagement's at. Um, and so I really enjoyed that. And the last thing I'll say to that, which is a little bit of an offshoot of this question is working with audio and working on this podcast is the first time I've ever dreamed and had nightmares about my grandmother's story. Somebody and, asked a question about your dreams as well. So they're okay. so jump. It's good. <laughs> um, because it, it was really powerful to me that after... That was that point, I was like, what, eight years or something into this work that for the first time I was having nightmares about 
the Holocaust, but it was like nightmares about the Holocaust as it would like play out today. Um, but also dreams, like dreaming about these people because all day I was sitting with their voices in my head. Um, and so that, that was like, that, that really changed the way that I told the story also when it like, they felt like they were inside of me differently through audio than with other, other ways of storytelling. Interesting. So uh, another very interesting question, uh, since you are connected to the USC Shaw Foundation to their educational program, someone asked about um, students, if any students after a presentation or a podcast or one of the programs has actually ventured themselves into their own family history. And if you have any stories that you can share with us, of course, not revealing too many details, but if you have any kind of, uh, you know, it's hard in education, but have you seen the impact on students? Yes. Yeah. So when I started working on this project, I was very much deep in like the world of journalism and photojournalism and trying to pitch this to editors and photographers and, you know, kind of a little bit more of that traditional path. Um, and it, it, honestly, like my life was, I mean, anybody in creative arts will say their life is like 85% rejection, <laughs> you know, on a, on a good day, usually it's much higher than that. Um, and what I found was that this project just like didn't make sense to people. Like uh, in the photo world, there was too much writing. In the writing world, there was too much photo. Um, like how are you gonna document history was one of the biggest questions I got, especially from a visual format. Um, and it didn't really make sense. And then when I started transitioning it and thinking about it from an educational space, that was really when not only did it start garnering interest from other people, but it started making more sense to me where like, you know, everyone wants you to give your elevator pitch and like, I'm, I'm just like really bad at elevator pitches because I have way too many words and there's, I get tangential and stuff. Um, but when I started thinking about it from, from an educational space, I suddenly was able to like say in a much simpler, more concrete terms, what I was trying to do. And I've never once wavered from the documentary mindset or from the ethics of journalism in, or um, not ethics of journalism, but eth ethics of documentary work uh, for this project. But I've been able to like go straight to students, which has been awesome because um, you know, I teach year long courses. I've turned my grandmother's story into a curriculum even before there was a podcast and I would get to go into communities on a weekly basis and use my grandmother's story as the base of teaching history. And I would get to hear all these questions from students and I would get to hear about how they were thinking about it in the years of, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, when the world kind of felt really, you know, has felt really shaky beneath us for many years now. And that brought such a new light to my grandmother's story. And it kept me very focused on present day. And it also allowed me to think very strategically of who my audience is as these young people. Um, in terms of an anecdote, I would say one of the things that I still think about to this day is um, for many years, I, and really the only the pandemic stopped this. So I was going to Moore College of Art in Philadelphia, which is an art school for women. Um, and I would go in every year and, and speak to a, to a class there. And it was a really interesting audience because uh, it's primarily not Jewish. And so it's really different to tell this story, of course, to a community that's primarily not Jewish versus Jewish. And there was this one woman who was a college student who said that my story reminded her of, she was African-American, it reminded her of going down to the plantations in the South where she knew her family was. And it was, th these are the types of connections that mean the most to me because it's somebody who comes from a completely different history but finds this connection and wanting to go back to their past. I've also in the past year connected um, with, with a most wonderful Armenian filmmaker who's the granddaughter of survivors. And we've found a really close connection within our stories. And so just as I was saying to Itai earlier, like there's this ability in this, this desire to touch the past and understand the past that can build these beautiful connections. And that's what I found with the students as well. I think that exactly uh, kind of demonstrates the name of the podcast. We all share the same sky. It's uh, so revealing and we see it in many different versions. What you're talking about here is talking about different uh, experiences with genocide and slavery even, but also sometimes you see between perpetrators and victims that the grandchildren, when they start talking, they really are sharing the same sky and the same language. Um, I have to say that someone uh, did write uh, that they hope that you do find a way to work together. 
uh, something unique <laughs> and meaningful for yourselves and for us in the future. So I wanted to pass it on. You know, I'm not hinting to anything, but a few people have no, mentioned it's, it's, that, that the, the storytelling tonight was uh, exceptional. There, there, I'll, I think uh, one more uh, question, uh, someone, Joan Gray is asking, how do I recreate the story of my family's escape from Czechoslovakia to Genoa, Italy? on the last American ship to leave Europe, how do how to try to fill, uh, try and fill in details. And I think it's something that Itai is dealing with as well. How do you fill in the details? You had uh, yeah. uh, a diary, you have a memoir, wow. but still. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, sometimes when the, if the person is still alive, the relevant people are still alive, then, then it's, it's always good to, Try and pick their minds uh, time after time. I mean, when you speak to uh, to to older folks, then then you sometimes understand that at a certain point of time they remember different right. uh, different details, and and that's that's one way. The other way is is the the hard way um, to to um, um, go through archives, uh, um, obviously history books, and sometimes. Well, I think in my case, what I uh, comprehended uh, quite recently is that I will never be able to recreate the whole story. I mean, this is, it is what it is. It's a, it's a story with, with blank spots, with, with uh, parts that I will never know, I will never be able to learn. And maybe in, in one way or another, this is what will continue uh, to drive me forward to, uh, um, to, to uh, um, encourage people and empower them to learn their stories and and other stories and and hopefully that they will do that. So so sorry, not not a great no, answer. First of all, <laughs> I I'll add to that. No, Anita, I think that's exactly right. And also, my dog has officially decided to make an appearance right on time. Yes. So I warned at the beginning of this. I said before we got on, I said. If she comes, I have her treat that'll that'll get her far away from me. So she's right on cue. <laughs> so. Right on cue. Right on cue. There you go. <laughs> Mine is barking too. There um, you go. She's very happy now. Um, I would say that, uh, to add to what Itai said, I think that this is one of the really hard things about going back to family history. I mean, I'm not somebody who went to all the archives for my story, um, which I think is a little bit different than what a lot of people do. Um, and I'm sure there's information I don't know that is available. Um, I can I it's a little bit overwhelming, honestly, sometimes when you think about how much has been documented about this history and what is available. Um, I think that's one of the things about when you ask about like retracing and going back, sometimes it's really just like smelling the air in a place that can help you understand it differently. So if you don't have the details and you are lacking some of the like you know, I think there's a question to ask is like how much of it is about the specifics of history and how much of it is like the emotion and what you can bring into it. So by sometimes by just being back somewhere, eating their food, um, understanding their culture, um, I think that that can help us help us connect to things that maybe there's not as many details to connect to. I mean, there's there's I follow my grandmother's story into America because I, I wanted to follow her until she became an American citizen. And I have way less information about her when she's in America. She just wasn't keeping diaries in the same way or they're not, they, they didn't they survive um, throughout the years. And I kind of had to like fill in with my own story. And I think that that's one of the, one of the, the special things about history is that like it's ongoing. It like didn't end at a certain year. Like we are that continuation. So how we are experiencing whatever that history is today can fill in some of those details that that might be difficult to find. So. Actually, that came up in the chat as well. This on, uh, uh, like you said at the beginning, Itai, you know, going between the past, the present and the future. Uh, also talking about Primo Levi, uh, someone mentioned the gray zone, the boundaries of judgment, ethics and history also related uh, memory is difficult, someone is saying, but I have to say, um, if I wanna close this session, um, my own uh, personal experience with uh, my first podcast. I, as a visual person, I have to say that um, this really was one of the most visual uh, stories <laughs> that I listened to. And there's so many details that I have 
and I remember. And the second thing is maybe really how your own personal life is weaved into the story. I think that this is one of the things that is so um, special about the grandchildren of, and also being able to immerse yourself uh, for so many years into this story that it really does become a, a weaved story of past, present, and of course, always looking to the future and to be able to take those steps. I recommend that everyone go to uh, the website, to go to the podcast, to listen with your ears and imagine uh, of the things that you're hearing. It's an incredible story and an adventure, uh, not only of your mother's, your grandmother's life, but also your life and, and what you experienced. Um, and of, like I said, we will be recording and have a recording available within the next few days and you can find it on our uh, uh, YouTube mm -hmm. channel. It won't, it'll be visual, <laughs> but, um, and of course look for the book and we're so happy about the book launch coming out in, in when did you say in August? Yeah, August. I thought it was June, August. Okay, August. so I will pre, it takes like 10 months to get to Israel, but we will all pre <laughs> here as well. And Itai, thank you so much for, first of all, for uh, introducing us to Rachel and uh, for having this very uh, intimate conversation about uh, your own experiences as, uh, as the three Gs. Um, someone is asking, what is the name of the podcast? So <laughs> we share the same sky. It may have been someone who came in a little late, uh, but uh, if you go to the YouTube channel, you'll be able to find all the information as well. And everybody's starting to say thank you and thank you for sharing. And I want to say the same as well. Thank you, Rachel, for coming to talk with us. Thank you, Itai. And we will say goodbye to everyone until our next uh, Talking Memory program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.